Nehemiah chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. Let's read it again. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. Father, take this word and plant it. Holy Ghost, cultivate it and cause it to bring forth much fruit. I'm asking God that you will do in this word whatever it is you want to do in this word, that you will speak to the people according to your spirit, by your spirit, God. Help us to hear from you. Help us to grow in this. Help us to apply it. I feel, in a sense, God, as if you've maybe pulled the brake on all the other things that I feel like you're wanting to do in this church to stop for a moment and speak something that's on your heart. That's just what I feel like with this message. I don't know how else to put it. So I'm asking that you say what you want to say, that you do what you want to do, that you have your way in this house this morning. God, we bless you and we love you in Jesus name. Amen. Y'all can be seated. So this morning I'm coming to you with this word a little differently than I have been over the last few weeks. Yesterday morning as I was in prayer, I asked the Lord what he wanted me to bring this morning and he spoke to me very clearly regarding Nehemiah chapter 3. So the word I'm going to bring to you is very simple. It is not deep theology in any way, shape, or form this morning. Young or old, you can understand this text this morning if you have an ear to hear. In fact, most of us probably understand this text and this point behind the text to, to some degree, I would have to imagine but I feel like the Lord would like for us to examine this text. I feel like there's going to be somebody that hears this message, whether here or on one of these cameras, that God would have to hear this word and strongly consider what it is that I believe he wants to say. So the text said, Then Eliashib the high priest rose up from his brethren the priest, and they builded the sheep gate. So naturally, some of you are probably asking yourselves, what is a sheep gate? So I'm going to address that first before we do anything else. Now, the sheep gate was the first gate to be restored, and it was rebuilt by the high priest and his fellow priests. Take note of that. The high priest was rebuilding the sheep gate and his fellow priests were to help him rebuild that sheep gate. Notice this, that Jesus is our high priest, but we are kings and priests of the new covenant. He is the high priest, the builder of the sheep gate, but we are kings and priests alongside of him and we are to help him restore the sheep gate. I want you to note also that this gate is the only gate that was consecrated as it was used to bringing sacrifices into the temple of God. Now it was called the sheep gate because the entrance was used for sheep that were entering into the temple from the sheep markets, which, you know, were the lambs that were being sold for temple sacrifices. Now the gate led to the sheep pool, which is where the sheep were washed for the sacrifices before they went in to be sacrificed. Now later on in the Bible, you're going to see that this is known as the pool of Bethesda. Now listen closely. A couple of thousand years later, while Jesus was on earth, every time that he entered into Jerusalem, it was through the sheep gate, except for his triumphal entry. The sheep gate also led Christ to Golgotha. That's the place, as we should know, where he was crucified for the sins of man. Now I want to take you through a couple of verses in John chapter 5, 2. It says, now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market or the sheep gate, a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. John 10, 7 says, Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door or the sheep of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. Or in other words, I am the gate of the sheep. Jesus says, I am the sheep gate. That is what he is saying right now. So you need to know he is the one and only sheep, sheep gate under the new covenant. He is that door. He is that gate. Let there be no misunderstanding whatsoever about it. It's not Jesus and it's Jesus only. He is the sheep gate. Now in the gospel of John, Jesus makes a reference of two different kinds of sheepfolds before he identifies himself as the sheep gate. In the first two verses, 
The type of sheepfold that he describes you would find in each village, which would allow the shepherds to return their sheep there at nighttime. It was protected by a strong door that could only be opened by the shepherd's key. Now, the second type of sheepfold is described in the verses thereafter. These sheep were, this was a place, again, that you saw this one when Jesus was born. It says that they, the shepherds led their flocks by night. And this type of sheepfold, you would usually have a ring of rocks. And right there at the entryway of that ring of rocks is where the shepherd would literally lay down at the threshold. And he himself would act as the sheep gate. And what that would do is it would prevent sheep from leaving. And it would prevent wolves from coming in. He would be the protection. He would be the threshold of that. He is the literal door or the literal sheep gate for his fold. Now it's important to remember that Jesus first identifies himself not as the good shepherd, but as the sheep gate or the gate for the sheep. In other words, you've got to first come into the fold before he's your shepherd. I'm taking you somewhere, I promise. When I was praying yesterday morning, as always, if Saturday comes along and I don't have a word yet, I said, God, I'm going to need something. And pretty quickly, the Lord sent me to Nehemiah chapter 3. I know what Nehemiah chapter 4 says because I've preached it five or six times. I wasn't exactly sure what to see in Nehemiah chapter 3, but I knew when I began to read Nehemiah chapter 3, I knew exactly what the Lord was wanting to say. I began to read the very first iota of that text. The Holy Ghost was all over me. I read two or three sentences. The Holy Ghost was all over me, and then I no longer felt his presence. So I started over, and I began to read again and the Holy Ghost was all over me. I was like, God, what are you trying to say? Because there's something in the first couple of sentences that you want me to see. So I'm walking around in my bedroom praying and I look out the window. When I look out the window, there's a gate right there outside of our window. That gate was desecrated. It's clear that nobody's gone in or out of it for a long time. The hinges look like they were broke down. They looked like there was bushes and weeds grown up around it. There was branches leaned up against it. Nobody's using that gate in any way shape or form and as I'm looking out the window I hear the Lord say repair the sheep gate mm. repair the sheep gate let me tell you what that looks like for us right now I'm looking out the window Jesus says I am the door I am the gate of the sheep let me tell you something right now. There is absolutely nothing whatsoever wrong with that gate that's outside of my window. It is in perfect working order. The only thing that really needs to happen is somebody needs to go out there and tear down some weeds. They need to remove some branches. They need to maybe reinstall the hinges, but the gate is perfectly fine. There is nothing wrong with the gate. The gate is perfect. The gate is in perfect working order. The problem is not the gate. The problem is what the people have allowed to grow around the gate or lean against the gate or put upon the gate or add to the gate or take away from the gate. Well, problem is, is that the people of God had said, Jesus is the only answer. They preached it from the very beginning. By faith in him, whosoever will shall come into the fold of God. And somewhere along the line, we began to tell people that you need to button your shirt a sudden way. You need to have long enough sleeves. If you don't shave your beard, you can't be in this fold. Right now, I'm telling you, folks, you go on the streets, you see men and women bound with all kinds of sin, all kinds of addictions, all kinds of problems. And right now, much of the church would say, you can't come into my fold until you get some things in order. Are you still drinking? Well, you better wait outside until somebody can come along and get you some help. No, sir, Jesus said, I am the gate. You bring him into that gate, and when he comes into my fold, those things are going to start to go away. I don't want your bushes. I don't want your branches. I don't want your weeds on my gate. You bring them in right now and I'll set them free. Amen. Let me tell you something about that gate. He ain't got no bolts. He ain't got any bars. And it's just like the temple. You'd never hear the sound of a hammer in the temple. What does that mean? That means the gate knows how to stand alone. That means it doesn't need your effort. 
It doesn't need your input. It doesn't need your dress code. It doesn't need your perspective. It doesn't need your judgment. It doesn't need you thinking that this person's not good enough and this one is. It doesn't need you playing Holy Ghost. It doesn't need you trying to tell people how to dress. It doesn't need you trying to tell people where to go. It needs you saying the gate is good enough. It is fit by itself. No need for bolts and screws. No need for a hammer on the job site. God made this gate the way it needs to be made. It knows what it's doing. It knows how to keep the sheep in and it knows how to keep the wolves out. I don't need to coach it. I don't need to take it by the hand and say, hey, Jesus, haven't you seen what that one's doing at the job site? Haven't you heard what they were doing in the secret place? Am I condoning sin? Absolutely not. What I'm doing is condemning you being the Holy Ghost. I'm saying right now, God has called you as a people to say the sheep gate is good enough. God wants you to restore the sheep gate and say, Jesus is enough. He's always been enough. Forget about the weeds. Forget about the bushes. Forget about the bolts. Forget about the screws. There are people. There are human beings. God came into the world to die for their sins just like he did mine. Let me tell you something, man. When I met Jesus, I was gross. I had addictions. I was taking whole bottles of pills every day. I was getting drunk, hammered every day. I was spending as much money as possible to get as high or drunk as possible. Whatever I had, if I didn't have enough to get as high as I wanted to, I'd take it from you and then get high. So there I was on my couch one night. I wasn't thinking about God. I wasn't thinking about salvation. I could care less about hell. All I wanted was some pills. So I'm laying there on the couch. There came along a tap on my side. I said I was laying there and there was a physical tap on my physical side. A second time this took place, most of you know this story, a third time it happened more stern. At that point, I was in a great panic because I was by myself on that couch. Nobody else was in the room. I was freaked out because something's touching me. I'm sober and nobody's in here. So I hop up and I cut the TV on. There was a TV preacher, maybe half as crazy as me. He was not in it for you to sow a thousand dollar seed so that you could come up a little. He was in it to tell the gospel and that was it. He was wearing plain clothes. He was walking through the graveyard in the pitch black of night and he was telling the good news of Jesus Christ. Mind you, I've lived in the Bible Belt my entire time that I've been alive and nobody ever brought me the gospel and reached out a hand and said, hey, there's a sheep gate that you can enter into and he will keep you behind the bars thereof. No, no, nobody ever did that. So that night, I listened to this man. Before I knew it, the sun was coming up. I sit and listen to the gospel for like eight hours. Ain't nobody preaching an eight-hour message. I'm telling you, since then, I've done some research. That man is nowhere to be found. I can't find him, no trace of him anywhere, online, whatsoever. I'm 100% sure that I will see him someday in the angelic host because he is not a man. God put him there for me to hear the gospel. So I listened to it all night long, and this is what I decided discovered. For the first time in my life, I was concerned with whether or not I had committed blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. That had never been a concern of mine. The reason I was concerned was because I took the Lord's name in vain almost every other word in all of my sentences. But I'm telling you, that's not what blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is, or the Holy Ghost would not be dealing with me. So that night, I started to think, man, I don't want to go to hell. I'm upset about the things I've done with my life. I'm sick and tired of this dead end road. How many of you know the flesh can't have those thoughts? That unless it's the Lord's hand upon you working a work, then I'm still laying on the couch thinking about pills. But God had come along and said, enough pills, I want you to think about something else. And the glory and the presence of that shepherd upon me was causing me to think about things of righteousness. But this is the point. In that moment, I prayed like a 10 second prayer. It is the absolute worst prayer you've ever heard. Now I lay me down to sleep was theologically way better than the prayer that I prayed. And yet the Lord came running to me. I said, God, I don't know what to do. I just know I'm nasty. Would you please forgive me? I prayed about a six second prayer. I was not crying like you think I should be at an altar. And God came running in a hurry. And what happened was my sin began to go away. I felt things departing from me. And I felt something brand 
brand new coming in physically. And in that moment, I instantly said, you know what? I need a Bible. That had never crossed my mind before. I never wanted a Bible. I told you last week that, you know what? When I got a Bible for Christmas, I was upset about it. But I'm telling you, that day when the Lord came unto me, this is what happened. He stretched out a hand to a disobedient and obstinate people. He didn't say, I want you to change your clothes first. He didn't say, I want you to get rid of the crack first. He didn't say, put away the Xanaxes first. He didn't do any of that. Let me tell you why. Because when the shepherd reaches his hand out and he brings you in behind that gate, when you get behind that gate, you don't want crack anymore. You don't want pills anymore. You don't want liquor anymore. You don't want to hurt people anymore. You don't want to cuss your granny anymore. That's not what you want to do anymore. So who are we to lay branches up against the gate and say, get right first before you come in? I'm telling you, man. You can find the most rotten one you can find out there. And if you bring them to the shepherd and he brings them behind the threshold of that gate, when they go back into the fold, man, I'm telling you, things are going to start to go away. There's no chance in the presence of God that the sin can abide. Jesus never came to me and told me to do anything first. He never condemned me for my sin because he has not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He did not say, you know what, I know you're an idiot. Best case scenario, you might get to walk with me. I'll think about taking you to heaven. If you can stop sinning first, then you can walk with me. That is never the gospel. Jesus said, you go into all the world. You go into the highways and the byways and the hedges. I want you to lift up a rock and find the nastiest one you can find. And I want you to bring them back to me. I don't want you to add a branch. I don't want you to add a bolt. I don't want you to add anything to it. I can do the job. You just get them to the gate. I want you to notice in Nehemiah, go ahead and look at it with your Bible. In verse 1, it begins with the sheep gate. In verse 32, it's the last verse, it ends with the sheep gate. It said in Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 1, the first thing you read about is the sheep gate. In Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 32, the last thing you read about is the sheep gate. Why is that? Because Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, he is the beginning and he is the end. He is the first and he is the last. He is the Alpha and he is the Omega. He is the only way. He is the only one. And somewhere along the way we said, you know what, Jesus? There's some things here in the middle we need to deal with. There's people I'd like to see them saved, but until they get some things right, I know they'll never make it. That's the wrong mindset. No, sir. They're never going to get anything right until you bring them to the one who is the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the one who formed them in their mother's womb. Until you bring them to him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that feels like your dress code is the answer, you're a thief and a robber. I said, you who think that your conduct or your actions or your words or what you can add to it or your amount of witnessing or the amount you put in the bag or whatever it is that you do, whoever you are that thinks the sheep gate's not enough, you're a thief and you're a robber. You need to repent and turn unto the Lord and while you're at it, stop putting those burdens and those bondages on somebody else that's never known the Lord. Bring them to the sheep gate. Let me make myself abundantly clear. Once you come into the sheep gate, these things don't stay. I don't smoke crack anymore. I don't smoke meth anymore. You're not going to see me preach the gospel in Daisy Dukes and a wife beater. I'm telling you right now, there's no chance in the world you're going to find me down at state line taking a three or four, putting a few back, getting hammered drunk. You're not going to see me doing certain things, not because I had to stop doing them to walk with the shepherd, but because when I met the shepherd and went in through the gate, I stopped doing them. And somewhere along the line, the church has said, put a branch.
branch upon that thing. Let's let the weeds grow up. That gate's not good enough. I feel like if they don't change their clothes first, then we can't receive them. You think it ain't a reality? We sat in a church for three years that had a big problem with what you did or did not wear. And I'm telling you, modesty is very important. But don't you sacrifice on the altar a sheep because they're not ready to dress like you. We saw a girl downtown, and she'd have been over you to saw everything she had. You think she's gonna change the outside before coming to the Lord, or is she gonna come to the Lord and the Lord's gonna change the outside? Right. There's a bigger problem than you think. Mm -hmm. Put away genealogies and the commandments and doctrines of men. God never came to, I challenge you, God never came to anybody here and told you what to do first before you could walk with him. That everybody that's had an encounter with Jesus came to the gate and because that gate was perfect and glorious and self-sufficient, when you entered into that gate, the, the presence of what's behind that gate started to deal with you. You said, you know what, I think I need to remove this or that piercing. It doesn't look right on a saint to have 15 eyebrow piercings. I've known people there, but they didn't do it first. They did it after they got in the presence. Right, right. Right. What concerns me is I know the Lord wanted me to bring this word, so examine yourself. Examine yourself on these cameras. The sheep gate is enough. You're fishers of men. Spend this sunny day out on the lake. And stand on your boat and shout to the waters, hey, fish. If you could, line up and come up here. And I want you to hop in my boat this way. If you don't do it this way, I don't want you. How many fish are you going to catch? No, no. You send out the gospel. And they take a hold of that goodness of God and that love of God. And you reel them in and you bring them into the boat. And once they get into the boat, things change for that fish. In fact, they no longer are a fish, I would suggest to you. But the point is this. They're not coming based upon certain terms. They're coming because they've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And therefore, they've come. They're not going to come under the pretense of you saying, make this change, make that change, do this or do that first. They're not coming for that reason. You go into the world, I challenge you to find the nastiest of the nastiest that you've ever seen seen and you bring them into this house and you let them sit beside you you let them have all of the you, I don't care if they're crack pots sticking out of their pocket because if they sit here long enough I guarantee you they're going to throw it away in a hurry I've had people that I've brought to church straight out of addictions that handed me their meth supplies to throw away I'm telling you folks it is not foreign to see these things as a reality but I did not tell him when I met him on State Street leave your meth here leave your pipe here leave your raggedy clothes here find something better to wear. Don't bring that stuff to the church. I didn't do that. I brought him to the church. He was stinking to high heaven. He didn't have very good clothes. He handed me his drugs. He handed me his pot. He wanted it thrown in the trash. But I did not stop him from coming first. The Bible says that Jesus is the gate through which we have access to the Father. That is Ephesians chapter 2. The Bible says that he is the new and living way. That is Hebrews chapter 10. I said Jesus is the almighty one. He is the cornerstone. I said he is the bridegroom, the high priest, the king of glory, the light of the world, the resurrection and the life, the mediator between God and man. I said he's the redeemer, the rock, the savior, the life, the door, the good shepherd. He is the sheep gate. And who in the world are we to Go against what is perfect and say, Jesus, you are not enough. We have got to add to or take away from your plan. Right. I told you it wasn't deep theology. Let's go to John 10. Let's look at it. Gospel of John, chapter 10. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Chapter 10. John chapter 10, starting at verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. It means there ain't but one way, and don't you dare change it. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep heareth his voice. 
And he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Why do they follow him? Because they've come to know him. Not because the rules were lived up to, but because they've come to know him, and he set upon their hearts some new rules. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Now this parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. What's the prerequisite? By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. By me, if you walk through this gate, when he comes through this gate, I guarantee you, I know exactly what to do to remedy his problem. I know exactly what to do to fix his situation. You bring him to me. Stop ministering to him in the wrong way on the way because most of them quit before they get to me. I want you to bring them to me and let me deal with it. one thing to speak life and to speak truth mm -hmm. and say Jesus is the answer you know I had a drunk man Friday yeah. hammered drunk yeah. blowing smoke in my face yeah. and I said God loves you he ain't mad at you man he's going to pursue you most people would say well you need to put that cigarette out and don't think about going back by that bar because look if you want to do yeah. it sounds good don't it mm -hmm. good luck then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. If he enters in, he'll be saved. And at that point in time, he'll find pasture. But prior to that, he's not finding pasture. He's got to enter in first. You got to get him there first. You got to bring him to the gate first. He's got to come to the Lord first. After that, he enters in and then he finds pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd giveth his sheep life. That he that is a hireling and not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth and the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep the hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine as the father knoweth me even so know I the father and lay down my life for my sheep in other words, I lay down my life. I'm the threshold. I am the door. If anything comes against them, it's got to come through me first. If any of them feels like it's a good idea that they leave, they've got to come through me first. I want to tell you right now, as, a, so, as somebody that's been full gospel the entire time I've been saved, it's a lot more difficult for you to escape the clutches of the Lord than what a lot of the Pentecostal church teaches. I'm telling you right now, that good shepherd ain't going to let you step over him and then walk away and never do anything about it. I'm telling you right now that that good shepherd's going to say, no, sir, y'all stay here. That one ain't going anywhere. He belongs to me. And right now, some of you need to know that the good shepherd is the good shepherd. He is the sheep gate. He is the threshold. He is the door. And because of him, he is good enough. We don't need any other provision. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am and known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father and lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I laid down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Now there was division, therefore, again among the Jews for these sayings. 
And many of them said, He hath the devil that is mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, These are not the words of him that hath the devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? And it was at Jerusalem that the feast of dedication, and, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do, I do in my Father's name, and they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because you're not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give unto them eternal life. I give unto them eternal life. I give unto them eternal life. And they shall not perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand, because I and my Father are one. Folks, I'm telling you if Jesus wasn't clear as he could possibly be clear that he is the gate he is the door he is the shepherd he is the alpha he is the omega he is the beginning he is the end he is the all in all he is the first and the last he is the ruler the reigner the all of all things that we need him to be and right now somebody needs to clearly understand that that nephew you've got that's got a pill problem you need to bring him to Jesus and quit telling him to put the pill bottle down first say bring your pill bottle to Jesus and let He'll flush them for you. But stop telling them what to do before they come to the Lord. I said, you got an aunt or an uncle right now that spends all day long in front of the TV drinking beer because they don't know the good shepherd. And right now, instead of calling them and saying, you know what, if you would quit drinking one day, you might hear from the Lord. No, you say, I want you to come to church with me so you can hear the good news of the gospel. And now I'm telling you, they're not going back to Kroger and buying natural ice again because they found the love of Jesus that cannot satisfy anything else but their soul. Come on. Amen. The truth is, people do what they do because they're hurting. They're frustrated. They're offended. They've been let down. And the church, rather than bring them to the gate and lead them into the presence of God, Tells them what to do before they make the journey to the gate. We like to meet men and tell them what they need to do to get right first before going to the doctor. What did Jesus say? I've not come to deal with the well, but to deal with those who are in need of help. Why in the world are you trying to get them well and then bring them to me? Bring them to me. I'll get them well. I've made the job really easy for you. I'm not telling you not to minister. I'm not telling you not to tell people what the things of righteousness are. I'm not telling you not to tell the people what the Bible does say and what is right and what is wrong. I'm not telling you to tell people that. But when it comes down to the point in time in which somebody says, you know what, I would be willing to consider, don't you dare give in when they say, what in the world kind of clothes do they wear to the church? You say you cover your nakedness and come down here and get in the presence of God. How many times have I heard somebody say, well, go down to the dollar store. You can get you a suit and tie for four fifty, and then you can come with me. I'm telling you folks, it's no wonder that so many are lost. Isaiah chapter 60 says, and the sons and strangers shall build up the walls. That's what they were doing in Nehemiah. And their kings shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor have I had mercy on thee. Therefore, thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day or night. He said, thy gates shall be open continually. Why? Because of mercy. Because of mercy, my gates are going to stand wide open. They will not be shut day or night. So because of that, I want you to understand the gate's not closed. It's not broke down. Don't let bushes grow up around it. Don't let bolts and the hammer of a man come alongside of it and try to do something to help it. No, sir, the gate is open day and night. I want you to go out into the world. I want you to find somebody that's lost. I want you to tell them about the goodness of God. I want you to tell them about Jesus Christ. Find the nastiest of the nasty that you can find. Stop hanging burdens upon them that are too much for yourself to even bear. Stop laying yokes upon them that even you cannot bear. I'm telling you, go into the world, tell the people that Jesus Christ is good. Go into the world and tell them that God died for their sins and they are welcome at the table. Yeah. Yeah. Then Eliashib the high priest rose up 
with his brethren, the priests. And they build it, the sheep gate. So what the Lord spoke to me Saturday morning was restore the sheep gate. And the message, I think, as you've determined, is very simple. There's no theological hurdles to jump. There's no hoops you've got to make your way through to figure it out. Some things are deep, some things are a challenge, and that's just the way it is for the people of God. But man, when you're fishing, all you've got to your advantage is the bait, the rod, and the line. I ain't never seen a fish poke its head out of the water and ask you what it needed to do first before taking the bait. Why are we doing it? Man, when I stood there and looked at that gate yesterday morning, the Lord was speaking to me, man. It was almost grown up over that gate. You couldn't open it until you mowed it. You couldn't open it until you weed-eated it. Nobody's going in or through it until you remove the things that stand in the way. Nothing wrong with the gate, let me remind you. Nothing wrong with Jesus. Nothing wrong with that door. Perfect working order. We don't need to look at people anymore that are covered in tattoos, 15 earrings, mohawk, what in the world ever else it is that causes you to look at them and start thinking, yeah, I don't know about this one. They probably ain't there yet. No, they're not there yet. They're not there yet. That's why you take them by the hand and convince them that God so loved the world that he gave his son for you. That you are valuable to him. Man, look at me. God wouldn't want me. Yeah, I couldn't go in a church. That, yes, you can. Yeah, I know a church you can go in looking just like that. Because I'm telling you, when you get there and the Holy Ghost begins to minister to your heart, once you come in through the gate, you're going to find help that I could never give you. I can try and twist your arm with every theological reason that I have and every Bible verse that I know, man. And hopefully I can convince you to think about the Lord for a few minutes. But the truth is, until I bring them to the gate, the one that has the ability to bring them in behind that gate and change their life, nothing is going to happen. Somebody needs to hear what I believe the Lord's wanting to say. Stop hanging burdens on people that don't belong there. Stop, self, stop examining somebody from the outside in and determining whether or not they're fit for salvation. Stop looking at somebody when they've got a pipe in their hand and they're blowing smoke in your face and they're cussing here and there and everywhere. Stop backpedaling and saying, you know what, this probably ain't the one. You, you, you better know that that is absolutely the one. That is absolutely the one. Father, I thank you for the door. For Jesus, the Lamb of God. God, I thank you that you came into the world to take away sin. God, help us to not be such tightwads with the invitations you've given us. God, I remember a time when I was first saved. I went to the racetrack. I didn't know what to say, but I had a bunch of tracks that I made myself so that they were sound doctrine at least I thought and I went and I passed them out everywhere I scattered them everywhere I went I feel like I got on the top platform in the track and threw them off the bleachers so that they would rain all over people and the point is it's because I wasn't looking at what they were wearing I wasn't looking at what they were drinking I wasn't looking at whether or not they were high none of that I was looking at the one that I knew had the ability to change anybody and everybody that had an ear to hear. And I pray, God, that you develop that in our hearts right now, not just here and not just on the cameras, but in churches across America, that you break off the foolish legalism that attaches things to people that aren't from heaven, that make it impossible for people to come in and be saved, that make folks twice the child of hell than they were to begin with. God, I don't stand here pointing fingers. You know how legalistic I was for a while. God, you know at the same time that it's not, it's not an effort to 
turn anything good into a license. That's, that's just foolish. I don't have the license. I have the invite. I bring them to you. We bring them to you. God, do a work in the hearts of the people here. Help us to, uh, to see and to hear your voice and your heartbeat. And to walk in what you've called us to, to be who you've called us to be, to function as you've called us to function. Help us to be a people, God, that restore the sheep gate. If there's anything in this path that would slow somebody down from coming to you, help us, God, to effectively and quickly begin to remove the hedges and the brush and the weeds and the, and the branches and whatever is growing up around that gate, God. I believe we're responsible for taking care of what's going on around that gate. We need to give people a clear entryway unto the Lamb of God. Father, we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.